Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our webinar, Automating Servers in the Cloud. This is the third webinar in our four-part October series called I'm in the Cloud, Now What? Today's webinar focuses on RightScale's secret sauce, the magic behind cloud automation, RightScale server templates. Today we'll share with you best practices for developing, testing, and maintaining your own custom server templates. Follow along at home with your own RightScale account. You should log in now, or if you don't already have a RightScale account, sign up right now for a free account at rightscale.com slash free. In a few minutes, um, we'll be starting with a demo and a walkthrough of our RightScale system, and you would have an opportunity to create your own server templates while you follow along. So while you're logging in or signing up for your new account, we'll ask you a few quick questions. First question is, are you using the cloud today? We define cloud as infrastructure as a service, so using Amazon EC2 or using Rackspace. So select the one that applies. Yes, you're running the cloud with one or more important projects, so that would be maybe your website in production or another application. Uh, yes, you're running at least one project with some importance. You're beginning to explore. Maybe no, you're not quite in the cloud yet. Leave this open for a few more seconds. Okay, cool. Um, everyone is running in the cloud to some degree, and a large percentage of the audience actually has several applications in production. So good to know. Thanks for your responses. Just have a few more. This will be very quick. We really appreciate your time. We'd like to know if you have ever created your own machine image, either in a virtualized setting or in the cloud. Select the one that applies. Yes, you've created too many to count. Yes, you've done it a few times, or no, you've never created your own machine image. Pushing out the results now to share with the audience. It looks like it's about 50-50. Yes, some of you have created machine images, maybe a few or a lot, and then the other half of the audience has never created. So good to know. Thank you. Bear with us, just two more questions and then we'll get started with the webinar. Okay, next question, which dynamic configuration tools have you used? So here, select all that apply. Um, I'm sure there's some RightScale users on here, so if you've ever used a RightScale server template, select that option. Or maybe you've tried Puppet, Chef, or some other dynamic configuration tools. If you have tried others, we'd be interested to hear what those are. Share that with us through the chat window. Or maybe you've just never used those types of tools before. And again, a very interesting split. So several of you have tried server templates, large percentages on Puppet, but then also an equally large percentage is, uh, has never used a dynamic configuration tool. So this is very helpful information for us, and it really helps us to understand you guys and tailor the content of the webinar. So final question, how many servers does your team manage? Select the one that applies, 1 to 10, 11 to 50. 51 to 200 or 201 plus. Pushing this out. Okay, so interesting split. We see that some of the audience is just running a handful of servers, but then a large percentage of the audience also is running more than 50. So thanks again for your time and your answers. We really appreciate it. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. So I'd like to introduce our speaker with us today. We're joined by Daryl Eaton. He's RightScale's Director of Product Management. Daryl has been with RightScale for a few years now, and he has a lot of past experience doing programming and systems administration. With the cloud, Daryl shared with me with the cloud, and with RightScale, he's been really excited to get rid of a lot of the manual work that he used to have to do. And so in today's webinar, he's excited to share more about that with you. One thing I'd like to point out about GoToWebinar is the questions section. Check it out in the main GoToWebinar control panel. Will Lehrman, our account manager, is standing by to answer your questions as they come in. And what Will's going to do is he'll answer each one of those questions, but then he'll also highlight some that are more generally applicable to the audience at large, and then Daryl will answer those live on the air. So if you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, and at certain points it does get technical, don't hold back. Ask your questions. You'll get an answer pretty much immediately. Um, and it'll also just be an interesting dialogue to hear that live Q&A. So ask questions early and often. And then with that, Daryl, I will hand it off to you. 
Thank you, Sarah. So I think that last poll question was um, probably really interesting for me to see. Um, there are a lot of you that are managing about 50 servers, and uh, our server templates help across the board, whether you're managing just a few or a lot, but they really, really come into play once you start to get uh, up into the hundreds and thousands. And we do have um, you know, some, some of our customers that are doing like a, a one system administrator, one system administrator to 1,000 servers um, uh, management ratio. So once you start to code your infrastructure, you can uh, increase the amount of servers that you manage um, um, quite significantly. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, very first, I'm going to just briefly go over what our server templates. It looks like some of you are using them already, which is great, but others have not. So I want to explain at a high level what are right scale server templates. Then I'm going to go, um, you know, kind of uh, into sort of a getting started uh, mode, which you, which if you're really fast, you can sort of um, follow along at home. But these recordings will also be available afterwards, um, so you'll be able to go back and pause uh, and and uh, use it to help you get started. And then I'll also go into some more advanced topics towards the end, um, which uh, I don't expect you to follow along necessarily, um, but I definitely want to introduce them so you can start to think about them when you're automating your infrastructure as a whole. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. So the first step to automation in RightScale is uh, what we call uh, server templates. And this is technology that we've developed. And um, it is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, there are other ways in RightScale to automate your infrastructure, but it is probably the most important piece of the puzzle. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Um, many of you said you have done, uh, you have worked with virtual machine images before, and some of you said you have not. Um, our hope is that you should not have to deal with them. Um, so for those of you who have not, don't worry about it. Um, the virtual machine image is uh, a great piece of technology. Um, it's allowed uh, for amazing advances in uh, specifically in dev and test across many enterprises. Um, but, but there are many uh, problems with it as well. So first of all, when you create your operating system, when you create your whole application, when you build out a machine and you take a snapshot of it or you bundle it up into an image, you're essentially chiseling the whole thing in stone. You're burning it to a CD. And when you want to change something, it's particularly painful. Uh, you have to go back in, what's wrong, change maybe one line in the script, and then create another huge giant file that you have to manage somewhere that you can't diff against the previous file. And uh, it becomes very hard to maintain um, these images. We've heard many of our customers come to us, you know, they say, look, I'm, I'm up to the point where I'm managing about 20 to 40 images and it's getting um, out of control. So this is typically when you can switch over to a server template model and uh, achieve much more um, efficiencies. And while virtual machine images are needed to make the cloud run, you know, the cloud can be um, so much more powerful once you get a layer above the virtual machine images, which is why I say they're, they're so pre-cloud. Um, they're great to get us here, and now I think we need to head on to the next level. So a server template is more like a playlist, if you can imagine. So if you have a CD on one side for a virtual machine image, you might have an iPod on the other side for a playlist. So Underneath the server template, we do uh, have a variety of, of images, which lets you spin up a machine on a variety of different clouds and infrastructures. But that's kind of where the image ends. Now we start to take those songs and play them on the server. So those songs would be scripts um, or recipes. And you go ahead and run those on the server. And if they're not quite right well, you just go ahead and, and uh, change one line in that script and rerun it. Uh, if they're not in the right order, you simply drag and drop them around just like you would on a playlist. Uh, if you have a few scripts that regularly accomplish um, certain tasks, songs that you like to listen to all the time, well then you would put them on a lot of different playlists or a lot of different server templates. So essentially you are coding your infrastructure rather than manually setting up by hand. This allows you to live above the image uh, and it also allows you to live above the cloud and I'll show you how we do that in a second. But the key thing here uh, in terms of what I've seen, uh, you know, I used to manage a lot of these um, servers just by, by hand. And um, you know, soon after joining RightScale, or actually before joining RightScale, but then soon after, really, really started to realize the power of server templates and the power of automating your servers and would never want to go back. So hopefully we can help you guys with that today. One point before we get started on some hands-on stuff, um, I just want to bring up a little data around what people are doing inside RightScale. 
So often when we see people come to us, they say, wow, well, is it kind of difficult to you know, create server templates? What are these things? Is it hard? Do I have to learn a new language? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, a lot of people are doing it, and you can do it too. Um, most servers that we manage are operated with customer-built server templates. So while we do create a lot of server templates that you can use out of the box, and there are a lot of good examples from us and from our partners in the multi-cloud marketplace, many, you can see that 51% of the server templates, uh, or sorry, 51% of the, the, the active servers that are in our platform are managed with server templates that have been completely custom-built by our customers. So this is just to give you a little motivation to say, yep, you can do this, and um, we'll go ahead and get started now. So first, um, I, I would suggest that most people start with what we call the base server template. So uh, what the base server template is, is it's kind of like if you're, in, if you're programming, you typically start with an SDK uh, for your programming language. It sets up all the libraries for you and maybe just gives you a little cursor, finally, um, in the main loop of your programming language. And then you start programming, you hit the compile button, and you get to go. That's kind of what the base server template does in the cloud. So typically, we provide a shell, a container, um, that allows you to put in your scripts. And once you press play, we take care of everything in terms of making it so on the actual server. In addition, we also include a bunch of default images that are already built, that already run across Amazon regions, across other clouds like Rackspace, so you don't have to deal with the image. Wherever you're spinning up a server, it looks the same to you. And then you can just focus on administering it and um, setting it up in the right way for your application. Finally, we have some pretty basic scripts on there that um, pretty much everyone needs out of the box. Um, most people want to monitor their machines. So we do have a script that will allow you to monitor um, processes um, by default. One thing I'll point out as we go along is that scripts allow you to not only automate your infrastructure and automate the configuration of the machine, but also pull out variable information that you don't want to hard code in, you don't want to burn to the CD. So mon processes is an input to the sys monitor install. So this right here is just a variable on this script. And if we type in things like um, crond or sshd or htpd, um, when the server starts up, we will start monitoring those processes that you specify and send that information back to WriteScale so that we can display it inside the dashboard. And all this will become pretty clear as I go through it. So what I will do now is uh, I'm going to come into the WriteScale dashboard. And for those of you who haven't been in here, this is kind of the first page that you start out with. Uh, you'll see a kind of an overview of your systems, how many servers are operational, any active alerts on any of them. Uh, how much are you spending across all your deployments, and anything that's happening on the servers uh, in this events pane um, as servers are completing scripts or, or um, throwing alerts, you can see that too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to find the base server template and how to get started. So what the first thing you want to do is you're going to design your new server template. If, uh, if you go into the design menu and you go to the multi-cloud marketplace, I'm going to show you how you can pull in the base server template. In the multi-cloud marketplace, we publish all our templates that we make available to our customers, as well as you can see um, some from our partners here, like IBM, um, who've uh, published uh, DB2 Express, as well as some Hadoop templates. And um, you can browse through in a variety of different ways to find what you're needing, to find what you need. Hey, Daryl, it looks like we're getting a couple questions in. I mm -hmm. see one so far. Is this only for Amazon EC2? Uh, no, so it's a good question. So you can see right here, um, the one that I'm about to import, base server template for Linux. Uh, you can see a couple different cloud icons on there already. Um, if you look into those cloud icons or some of the descriptions, um, you can start to see what um, different clouds they're supported on. So this is the template that I want to get started on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on import. And once this uh, goes ahead and comes in, I actually have it open up here. Um, you'll see now this is in your sort of library of, of server templates. And the first thing you want to do is click clone. This is essentially creating a copy of that 
server template that you can start to use, add scripts to, and um, set up for your server. So now you have your own version of this server template, and I'm going to call this um, webinar automation example. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and add this to a server. Um, one thing I want to point out about the base server templates before I go ahead and create a server is, again, we did all the hard work of creating all the images for you. So you can see here on this particular template, um, we have uh, CentOS 5.6, we have Ubuntu 10.04, we have it across Rackspace, Singapore, we have KVM and Zem server images for some of the private clouds. And whenever you spin up one of these templates on a cloud, we're going to decide, okay, if you're running on Rackspace, we're going to spin up this one. Um, if you're running on, uh, so one of the questions I see coming in from the audience is, what is the max RAM CPU on these servers? Well, that depends on what the cloud makes available. So all the clouds have different sizes of instances with different amounts of RAM um, and cores that are available to you. So you would choose that when you start up your server, and then we'll decide, okay, if we need an x64-based um, image, we're going to put that down if it's one of, the larger, one of the larger instance types that's coming up. Before I go into actually creating a server, I also want to point out that we have a base server template for Windows as well. Same thing here. We've gone through all the work of creating the images for you across all the different regions of Amazon, across different clouds. Um, so you can see that you can spin up a 2008 R2, 2003, 2008 image, and um, when you spin it up, we'll just, you, know, you can decide, I want a 2008 machine, and we'll spin up the right image for you. On Windows, the scripting language is traditionally PowerShell. So if, if uh, you're scripting out stuff for Windows, you'll be using PowerShell 2.0 um, to do that. Again, you see us installing the basic monitoring here that everyone will need. So let's go ahead and create a server. I actually want to spin this on, up on Rackspace, so I'm going to choose Rackspace. And let's leave it called that. Um, and go ahead and just go ahead and create the server. And then I'll spin it up. Now you can see here that um, the default type is a one gigabyte server. Um, that's specified by the um, uh, the template as, you know, maybe this is the best one to spin it up on. But if you wanted to, you could spin it up on one of the larger servers that Rackspace has. So let's go ahead and go back. Um, same thing on Amazon. You can choose the instance type here. Um, and you can also choose, as you saw when I created the server, that region that is, um, Amazon has a bunch of different regions. Um, you can choose whichever region you want the server to spin up on, and we'll, we have images on each region, so we'll go ahead. If you're on Singapore, we'll spin it up on Singapore. If on your on your U.S. East, we'll spin up on U.S. East, and the scripts will still run regardless. All right, next, <clears throat> while this is, what I'm going to do is go ahead and launch the server. So I clicked on Launch. There are a few. Um, here is uh, what I was talking about on Inputs. This is the variable information that's extracted away from uh, the scripts. So I can actually choose to specify um, what this should be. So mon processes, I could modify. I can, I can actually monitor SSHD if I want to. So I'm going to go ahead and specify that I want to monitor that and click Launch. Now while that server is launching, let's go ahead into the next topic. So that was starting off with the base server template. Um, now what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to work on that instance. So the, the instance is starting up. And once it's uh, eventually started up, you'll get an SSH console. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pull over one that I already have um, up and running. And now you're going to actually configure the machine. The key here is that whenever you do any configuration on the machine, you're going to want to record that into um, the, the write script that goes into the server template. So the write script is essentially the song that you're putting um, in the playlist. So for Rackspace, I need to actually set up IP tables. Um, for this particular machine, 
I needed to have, um, this would be a web server, so I need to have port 80 and 443 open. Uh, if I look at IP tables, I notice that it is not open, so I'm going to have to modify it. And I will pull in uh, port 80 and port 443 rules. Notice here now, I'm going to have to um, restart IP tables. And it looks like it's all okay. And now IP tables should have those to open. <clears throat> so you can see here um, that uh, down here at the bottom, HTTP and HTTPS are now open. Now what I want to do is record this in a script. Typically, you might actually just create a script on the instance. Um, something like this. And what I'm going to do is just take this this the IP tables configuration as I need it. to the IP tables configuration every time. So we'll see if that works. Good. Now here comes how this goes into right scale. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to design a new write script called set of IP tables. Here's where you would paste the script. The one key thing that I want to point out is how you extract that variable information. So let's see, you don't always want to do port 80. You know, sometimes it's on port 8080, um, but you want to be able to specify it when the machine starts up. You would simply define an environment variable. You can do the same thing in PowerShell. And then what you do is you click on identify, and we will pull that out as a variable that's specified on, on the startup. Go ahead and click save on that write script. Now, if you go back to your server template that you were setting up, go to scripts. Um, sorry, this is the server. Let's go to the server template behind it. You'll see the four scripts that came with the base server template. And then I'm going to go ahead and add the one that I just created. You'll see now there's a new input here called port, which I'm going to go ahead and create a default setting for that I can override at the server level. And now when we go back to the server, see uh, Okay, this is actually up and running now. So I'm going to open up an SSH console here, just to this one. And we can verify. Uh -oh. <laughs> Maybe it's not done up. Maybe it's not set up just yet. What you can see here is that there is a new script here called setup rackspace IP tables that I've added. And I can go ahead and click on run on this script. It will ask me for the variable information I need to set. And then I click continue. 
and it will run the script on that server. So you can see here scheduling execution of setup IP table script. And that's the way that you would go ahead and automate your servers. And let me see if the demo gods are looking kindly upon me one more time. And they are. And you can see that ADM443 was written down to the machine. And IP table should have been restarted. And you can see that it is now in, um, in the policies for IP tables. So that is essentially how you record every step you take and get it back on the server template for that particular server. And you also saw here how I just went ahead and ran the script. This is essentially where, how you want to get your servers to, which is at any point I can come in and make anything so. I can just come here and press play and get the server into a certain state. Um, one of the key things that I wanted to point out is a concept called item potency. And what this means is that you can run your script over and over again without messing up your server. So instead of modifying, uh, instead of having a script that modifies files in a certain way, maybe using double carrots to append to a file, you use a single carrot to overwrite a file. That way if you run it again and again, you're always getting the server back to the same state. So you'll notice on my script that if I ran this over again, I'm using a single carrot here, which will just overwrite the IP tables and get it back to that same state. This is really helpful for debugging when you want to make sure that your scripts are running correctly um, and you can come to this um, um, area on the server and just run it over and over again. So let's go back here. And I'm going to pause for a second just to check out some of the questions. Um, do server templates accommodate multiple VM designs, N-tier designs? And is there a VMware ESX server template? Um, so let me take a little step higher up. So the, again, the images are separated from the server template. So we do have write images, what we call them write images, virtual machine images, um, for VMware ESX. And um, they're published um, for certain clouds. So if you wanted to uh, do that on certain private clouds, um, you would have to add that image to the server template um, to get that up and running. Do server templates accommodate multiple VM designs? Um, server templates have what is called a multi-cloud image attached to them. And if I go to the server template behind here, for example, You can see that I have multiple images attached. They're of different types, too. I have some on KVM, some on Zen server. Um, they're across different clouds, as you can see here. And I can specify which image I want to be the default when the machine starts up. So in that way, you can uh, specify, you know, I want a VMware ESX server for my private cloud, and I want a certain um, you know, image up on Amazon for my public cloud. And where you spin up that server, it will choose the right image. Okay, so let's move from there. So next topic, don't reinvent the wheel. So while most people do create their own server templates, I would highly, highly recommend that you go out to our multi-cloud marketplace and browse all the examples that we have for you there. Um, when RightScale publishes templates, we do it in a way that, you know, we do expect you to use these in production environments. We heavily test them. And um, about, um, you know, as you saw, about 20-something percent of our active servers are under management by right scale published templates um, without any changes. So I'd encourage you to go out there, check out and see what partners we have um, and what they've published, uh, browse the examples, and then pull in what you need. So let me go ahead and show you how to do that. So again, design server templates. This takes you to the multi-cloud marketplace for the server templates. Um, you can see some of the highest rated ones, uh, you can go into the ones that have been recently added. Um, you can see we have a database manager for MySQL here across many clouds. Um, you can search for um, particular tools you think you might need. So I search for Hadoop. I can see some Hadoop templates here as well as some uh, um, uh, IBM's Big Insights uh, Basic Edition. Master and Data Nodes templates they've published here that they've actually um, published across multiple clouds. I can use the categories uh, down the left here. 
to see what databases I can manage. So we have database managers for MySQL, um, for Microsoft SQL Server, uh, for Postgres. Um, we have partners who have like um, Couchbase and a published Membase, um, so more like a NoSQL SQL Server. Um, you can look at all the application servers uh, that are published out there. Uh, we have PHP servers published by ourselves, published by our partners um, uh, Zend. Um, we have Rails servers, Tomcat servers, the list goes on and on. So again, one of the best things you can do is go through here, find out what you need, and then um, uh, see what you can make of it. Often I'll pull in templates here and, uh, and then start building on top of them. So for this example, I want to create a LAMP with WordPress as the application. Uh, server on Rackspace. And if I go and search for LAMP in here, I see that there's a, a template, a couple templates that work on Rackspace. Um, and if I search for WordPress, I can see that we do have a WordPress template. So it's working on Amazon here. Um, so I imported both of those. And I can see that they're pretty much identical if I look back and forth. And again, you know, once you get into the templates, you can see what's there and what's not. Um, there is one script that is different called app WordPress configure. So I'm going to want to pull that script onto the one that works on Rackspace. And that's what I went ahead and did. So I created this new template called multi-cloud lamp with WordPress. And if I look at the scripts, it's essentially the lamp template where I added the app WordPress configure script. And I added this Rackspace HTTP and HTTPS port script that I created before. And what this has done is allowed me to create a template um, that didn't exist in the library, but that does exactly what I need, but without having to do 90% of the work. And so that server is spun up here. And um, I have to make sure that uh, this script has run, which, uh, yes, it has. So the ports are open. So you can see here's the blog running on Rackspace. Um, with the template that I created myself. One thing that I want to point out um, is a tool called diff. So you can actually diff the templates against other templates. And this is really helpful when you're trying to maybe learn what's different between templates and the library. If I diff my lamp with WordPress template with the original template that I pulled into the library, you can see exactly what I changed. So here I made a minor modification to the web application code checkout. Um, and I added the app WordPress configure. I added the HTTP, HTTPS open ports, but pretty much everything else is the same so that I can get this up and running as quickly as possible. One thing to also point out is the library has hundreds of templates in it. So I want to point out um, the advanced options here. You can search within the category. You can search um, by a particular cloud. Um, you can uh, sort the results that come back. One particular thing that I find helpful is um, sorting by something like, or searching by description. So if I search for a SQL Server, I'll not only find the database manager for SQL Server, but I'll also find other templates that might work with it, like the IIS app server. Um, so it's, it's good to, uh, sometimes if you're not finding what you're looking for, drop down to the title and description. Um, which is a little bit more exhaustive search uh, to find what you need. Okay. So a few more advanced topics on server templates. For each one, you'll notice that at the bottom, um, we have what are called decommissioned scripts. Now these let you do cleanup. So anytime you shut down a server, um, you can do things like disconnect from load balancers, to um, backup files or databases, detach volumes. So for those things you need to clean up when a server shuts down, it's very important to get those in the decommissioned scripts. Another thing to point out is a tool that we have on each instance called RS Run Write Script or RS Run Recipe. So sometimes when you're decommissioning, you need to tell other machines uh, what to do. And this is a little bit more advanced automation that we have in some of our um, three-tier templates. Uh, for example, the, um, the PHP template, uh, the PHP uh, HAProxy and database tiers that we have on Rackspace have to manually 
set and unset or open and close the ports uh, in IP tables on other machines um, when we're auto-scaling. So for example, if a new PHP server is spinning up, it has to reach out to the database and to the, the proxy servers and say, open your port to my IP. And so what you can do is call RS run write script. The recipient tags would be HA proxy or database, however you tag them. And then you would actually call the remote script and then pass in an input. So right here the input might be um, uh, you know, IP for the, um, for the machine to open it to. And then you would specify the IP of myself and then it would open those ports to myself. Again, on decommission, we wouldn't want uh, HAProxy serving up any pages from uh, the app servers from other IPs. So when we shut down and we have to give our IP back to the cloud, we call this to remove um, access um, from HAProxy in the database uh, to those particular IPs. There's a question uh, I want to just grab right there since I was talking about three-tier architectures. To create a three-tier architecture, load balancer, app server, database, do you need three single server templates or one multi-tier template? So multi-tier template, it might be synonymous with something that we call a deployment. So you can group servers together um, by deployments. You can put application servers in what we call an array. And that allows you to sort of group the architecture together in a logical manner. And then you would have three separate templates for the load balancer and the app server and the database. For example, the array allows you to specify, I'm going to need 30 PHP um, servers. And instead of manually in setting up, uh, launching and setting up 30 PHP servers, you create one PHP template. You put that in an array, and you specify 30 as the number that you want. And we will spin up 30 servers for you and configure each one exactly um, to the template that you specified. So one of the final things that I want to point out as you're getting started is our, is our term called compatibility, compatibility release. And essentially what this is, is our blood, sweat, and tears. Literally, we spend a lot of time on all of these templates that you see tagged um, at the end of their name with something like 11H1. This means 2011, first half. And what we did is we tested all of these templates together to make sure that when you're creating those deployments, when you're creating those multi-tier architectures, that when you use these templates, they will work together. So for example, if you were to pull um, a PHP um, three-tier architecture, you would pull the HAProxy 11H1, you'd pull the PHP app server 11H1, and you'd pull the MySQL database manager 11H1. And those will all be guaranteed that they will work together. And not only that, but since they all have common base images, and since all the software repositories are the same, you can use scripts from any of these templates in the compatibility release and put them on other servers and they're guaranteed to come up. So one key thing to point out about the cloud is your software repositories like uh, CentOS will pull from the, the CentOS mirrors are constantly changing. And this is not great when you have a lot of automation behind your servers where essentially WriteScale is spinning up servers for you automatically. So what we actually do is we mirror the software repositories for CentOS and for Ubuntu and, and we make it so that we can freeze it to a specific date. This way you can always guarantee that when you launch a server, it's going to come up with the packages that were available on that date so it's guaranteed to boot. And then you decide when you want to bring in new packages by changing the date of those frozen repositories. Test them out, make sure it all works first, and then you would roll that date up to all your production servers. So I would highly suggest starting off with the compatibility release. You can read more about it on our support portal, which is at go to support.writesale.com. Easy search for compatibility release. This will walk you through exactly um, what the benefits are of using compatibility release templates to get started with. Um, it also has this little tip here. Um, you can use this little drop-down list that's on here to say, okay, well, I am using um, CentOS 5.4, so I want to see all the scripts that I have available to me that I know if I pull onto any of my 11H1 servers, these will work out of the box. 
So this is also a helpful tool. Um, and you can also search by write script. If you're using a particular write script, you can see what images that works with and what other scripts will work with those images that you're running on. Again, kind of an advanced topic. I would definitely um, recommend that you read through that on the support portal. But as you are beginning to build multi-tier architectures, um, that is the way to go. So finally, just to reiterate, you definitely don't want to type the same command twice. Um, you want to start from a base, record what you're doing, and then test what you've done. Uh, you know, going back to um, why this is valuable. So there was, there's one server that I set up for an internal team here at WriteScale um, where I wanted to create a, um, a server that essentially acted as a proxy for an external SaaS um, provider that we use and allows them to sort of get into our firewall through a uh, connector that lives on that server. And so I went through and I set it all up. I, I scripted it out, anything that I had to compile, um, I put into a tar, I attached that to a write script. That way, when I bring that down and unpack it, everything is the way that it should be. Um, and I can start that server over and over again. It always ends up the same, the same way. And one time I was out on uh, camping Joshua Tree. Um, not sure why the server went down, but I came back and noticed that it had only been running for a day. And so I asked someone in our IT department, you know, what happened to the server? And they're like, I'm not quite sure. Um, but while they were gone, they went in, realized it was down. They pressed play on that server, brought it back up. And even though that person who pressed play had never configured that machine or that application before, it came up perfectly. Everything was back up and running again. And this is the power of encoding everything into the server templates. And I've, I've had many customers come back and say, you know, we never really scripted things before because it was kind of a pain and we knew it was good, best practices. And we love the fact that we are now forced to do this because it enables great scale. And we do have customers that are literally running a thousand servers for each system administrator um, with this. So one final thing, learn from others. You know, we've even had customers publish some of their server templates to our library. Um, so you can go out there and look at our templates, our customers' templates, and our partners' templates. Uh, there's a lot of good content out there that you can just pick from and um, start to collect and create your own songs, create your own playlists, and create your own server templates. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We've got a couple questions that we're going to answer. Um, Daryl will jump on those in a second. So just make sure that you um, continue asking those. And as they come in, Daryl will address the first one on here. Daryl, do you want to take that one? Sure. So I see a question. I'm listening to all this, and it sounds fairly complex. And I do want to reiterate that um, you know, as you are um, starting to set up your servers, you're going to have to set them up in one way or the other. And as you are scripting it out and as you are um, uh, running the commands, if you record all that, um, I think you will start to see, once you get into it, um, that it becomes pretty routine and you'll be able to set up your servers. But, but you're saying, okay, now you're a developer, so you're not necessarily a system administrator. You just want a three-tier architecture for a web app that you wanted to prototype out. Is there a one-click deal to get me a Ruby or PHP Zen server instance up with a DB of my choosing? This is where I would definitely recommend that you go out and look at our, um, um, our server template library. So for example, there are LAMP um, stacks, like the one that you saw that I had, which has a few different flavors of MySQL. Um, and you could spin it up and get started on your PHP application. It's actually set up to pull um, your PHP code from an external repository, as well as your um, dump of the MySQL database. There are also Rails all-in-ones. Um, and yes, if you did want to set up uh, something with, let's say, Postgres, you could potentially pull in the PHP app server, the Postgres template, and um, get going um, from just those two templates to start testing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned PHP Zend. We, we are partners with Zend, and they do have a, uh, a three-tier stack that is, uh, that is easily stand up, that you can easily stand up. There's actually a whole solution pack out there. Um, if you talk to uh, some of our sales account reps, and I encourage you to talk to me, Will, who's online, um, and they can walk you through setting up a Zend uh, stack very easily and a variety of different um, templates for their different versions uh, that you can stand up um, very easily. 
I'm going to jump in real quick, and actually I noticed that there's several people on the call today who are interested in the three-tier architecture. I'd recommend a couple weeks ago we did a webinar with our technical trainer called From Zero to Cloud in 60 Minutes, and within the course of that 60-minute webinar, we actually went from zero to launching a three-tier deployment in the cloud. So I'd recommend if you want to check it out, it's at rightscale.com slash webinars, and just do a search on the page for zero. Um, and that webinar will come up and you'll be able to see how that worked out. And then also I'd recommend if you check out support.rightscale.com slash tutorials, there's a written out tutorial about how to set up a three-tier deployment as well. So I'd recommend taking a look at those resources too. One thing I'd also point out, you know, if I go back to the slide um, where I had the information around you know, who's using the server templates and what they're what they're constructing, um, you know, unlike someone like Engine Yard, you know, just the platform as a service. Um, while we do provide the templates that you can just spin up a, a one-click thing and get your code up there and, and start testing, um, Rightscale goes beyond that. What we allow you to do is not only spin up those templates, but then customize them and modify them. And often we find that the customers who come to us, you know, those those out-of-the-box solutions don't quite work. They might get them started. But then the minute they need to sort of go beyond a few servers or um, the application starts pulling in things besides just Rails, um, a Rails app, mm -hmm. now they're kind of stuck. And this is where Rayscale comes in, where you come in, you create this exact server that you want, and you're essentially creating your own platform as a service. So while it might sound a little more complex, the idea is that it does offer more power um, for once you graduate beyond just testing out your application. Okay, so I'm looking back at the questions. Um, can you program the right scale runtime so that it will monitor the application load and dynamically spin up instances as the need arises? Um, so one of the things that I mentioned during the um, webinar is the fact that we have something called scalable arrays. And there's some stuff going on in this, in this uh, account here, if you're looking. Um, there's a deployment here called Elasticity Web Demo, and in it you'll see down here at the bottom uh, what we have called arrays. So these are the app servers that are in the deployment, and yes, these automatically uh, spin up based on um, uh, parameters that you set. So if I look at that array, you can see A what server template is behind this array. So whenever we spin up new servers, we're going to spin up this particular server template. And that's pretty key. Um, if you remember the inputs, you know, we're, you're going to be putting variable information in terms of this is the, um, the domain name or the IP address of the database that you need to connect to, and that goes down into the application server, and as it comes up, um, it will connect to the right database. For example, if you copy this deployment, or if you cloned this deployment, which you can do to make a copy, for a dev environment rather than the production environment, you might point them to a different database. Um, so all the variable information is abstracted out, and then you can have, you know, what are, how am I scaling? So when do I make the decision to scale up? Um, I can either schedule it to scale up automatically, or I can do it by um, an alert. Um, so in this case, maybe the CPU is getting too um, um, overloaded, or there's too many Apache connections, and I can specify a custom alert to send to the array, and then once there's enough people complaining, I can spin it up by a specified amount. Let's see, okay, here's actually a good question that I am um, I'm appreciate, I appreciate that you asked this. So can you convert, say, a cloud.com template into an RS template? So cloud.com calls their images templates. And a template in cloud.com is simply a virtual machine image. So we actually do use cloud.com templates uh, in that we create virtual machine images for cloud.com. And then those go underneath our right scale templates. So, um, Cloud.com does not have a concept of server templates like Rightscale does. Um, these are still more like the virtual machine images that you're used to. Um, let's see, does Rightscale provide any tools to identify bottlenecks and optimize performance for an end-tier architecture? 
For example, instrumentation processing time at each layer. So let me pull back up this. Uh, so again, if I go back to this deployment, and I go to the monitoring tab, so when you saw the monitoring and coming back, uh, or when you saw me specify different um, applications to monitor, um, this is what you, you know is getting sent back to WriteScale. So for example, um, if I wanted to see what my, uh, but let's say if I select my database, Collectee is sending back a variety of different information that I can monitor um, to see where bottlenecks might be. So for example, I can check out the different graphs, um, the disk usage, uh, the file system. You know, maybe I, I come in here and I find out that the disk softs are overloaded for the database. In that sense, this lets you drill down onto where the bottlenecks might be. Um, is the memory overloaded? Do I need to upgrade this to a larger instance on the cloud to get more memory? Um, and help you um, sort of optimize your end tier architecture in that way. And I do believe we have some other webinars. Yeah, I was actually just going to jump in and say I hate to keep pointing you guys to other webinars, but just last week, actually perfect topic, optimizing your cloud applications in right scale, that was exactly what we discussed. Um, and we, again, had our VP of Engineering, Rafael Saavedra, on that, and he talked through all the different tools within right scale that are available for optimizing your application. So we also covered monitoring, we covered new relics, so that might be something that you'd like to take a look at as well. Then finally, one more thing on that question you said at each tier, you know, one of the things that I want to point out is you can, even in the application tier, as the machines are auto-scaling coming up and down, you will see those machines here um, in this cluster, and we have a variety of different ways to look at that. Um, you can aggregate them to see kind of how they're performing as a group, um, or, or we have heat maps as well to see when they're, when they're getting hot. So I would definitely encourage you to check out the monitoring um, uh, information on the support portal uh, to see what's possible. Uh, let's see, I think one more question here. I noticed that Amazon instances running Ubuntu 11.04 have occasional booting problems rendering the instance unusable. Does WriteScale have the same problem? Again, we are abstracted in that we do use the images um, that are on a particular cloud. Um, it depends on what image you're using, what Ubuntu 11.04 image that you're using um, that's rendering it unusable. If you decide to use that same image in WriteScale, then you will have the same problems. However, you can do things like set up alerts, or if you're in an auto-scaling array and an instance just doesn't come up usable, we'll automatically spin up another one uh, to come in and handle that load. Um, we actually publish our own images, so we do have um, Ubuntu 10.04, which is their long-term support um, image, that we have heavily tested. Um, we even had to choose a different kernel um, than the one that was available by default, so that we can guarantee that it's pretty much going to come up, uh, come hell or high water, um, when it's booted. So I would encourage you to check out the, the right images behind WriteScale. These are images that we publish and make available often in our base server templates as well as in our library. And these are uh, images that are quite heavily tested um, by both ourselves and by our customers who are running uh, you know, thousands of servers with their applications. Cool. And with that, we are going to end the live portion of our webinar. If you, have, if you continue to have questions, we will keep the webinar open and we'll continue answering those. But we're going to let Daryl go take his lunch now. Um, I'd like to remind you guys that this webinar has been recorded. We'll be posting it on our site later today or tomorrow morning, and we'll be sending you out an email to let you know once that's been posted um, so you can check it out again or share it with your friends. Um, there's a couple other resources listed out here. Um, a couple points, we referred you guys over to our webinar section of our website to check out the Zero to Cloud in 60 Minutes or Optimizing Your Cloud Applications in Right Scale, and you can just visit that by visiting rightscale.com slash webinars. Our support portal has a lot of information about the three-tier architectures and some other exercises that you can go through to become familiar with Right Scale in the cloud. I also wanted to let you know, um, next week concludes our webinar series with operational best practices in the cloud. We'll be joined again by Rafael Saavedra, our VP of Engineering. And then if you're up in the Bay Area in the beginning of November, we have our next RightScale conference. It's actually our fifth time doing the RightScale conference. I encourage you to attend that. The main conference day is November 9th in Santa Clara, but buffered on either side on November 8th and also November 10th, we have full-day RightScale zero-to-cloud trainings 
Um, they're actually quite inexpensive and we have discount codes that we can share with you too as thanks for joining us on this webinar. Just visit rightscale.com slash conference and if you are interested in that discount code just write into us. Our email is webinars at rightscale.com. We can hook you guys up. So thanks for joining us. Check out the archive and have a great rest of your day. Bye.